Welcome to the One Within All Back to the Interverse podcast. It's me, your host, Chance, surviving in the 12 degrees with uh, high spirits in this uh, middle of February moment. I'm joined today with Ryan Kemp. He's an author, someone who's traveled probably more than 95% of humans will ever travel. And he's a deep thinker on many subjects that I think are going to be useful to us to investigate in our own lives, especially Ayurveda, which is etymologically a word that means something very close to biology, but it's a holistic science. We've touched on it last year with an amazing practitioner, Acharya Shunya, and I think it's high time to get back into looking at Ayurveda, but what I like about Ryan's work and his book, The Age of Separation, which you can find linked in the show notes or on Amazon, is that he takes a look at the condition of accumulation as described by Ayurveda and applies it to our society as one larger organism. And it's very interesting to see how psychic phenomenon can accumulate and create dis-ease in very much the same way that the concept of material accumulation causes disease to the realm. So there's a lot of nice fractal mirroring to reflect with when you read Ryan's book, The Age of Separation. There's a lot more to it than just those two things, but We'll get into some of the other topics that Ryan has presented in his writing. He's also an author of children's books, and you can catch him for consultation on a variety of things from meditation to spiritual coaching and, of course, the wellness aspect of all things holistic health that Ayurveda is able to assist with. So really excited to be talking with Ryan today. We've been trying to make this happen for a little while, but <laughs> appointments in this time-based construct that we pretend is reality are sometimes not the way that things flow. So I'm glad today's the day that we decided to make the flow happen. It's going to be a very interesting one, and I'm excited to get into it. Don't forget, like I said, the description or the show notes are where you can find links to everything that Ryan's up to, how you can connect with them, and of course to get the link to Patreon where you can become a $5 a month subscriber to Interverse and get the second hour of every conversation, which is a great deal. So enough of that transactionality. Let's get into it. Ryan, my man, welcome to the Interverse. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here in this in this Interverse encapsulated in our Outerverse and Multiverse. <laughs> yeah, I had no idea what that name even meant when I first started out, and it gets deeper all the time for me. But that is a big part of your book, actually, is looking at how everything, even traveling in the external world, is actually moving through different par different parts of ourself and bringing witness to the full spectrum of what it means to be, um, you know, a drop in the ocean that is also containing the entire thing. Absolutely. I think that that's, that, that's our journey from materialism into matter. And I think a lot of times our society is so trapped in the masculine, the logical, the materialistic, that we have a hard time understanding and comprehending things that are not visible to us or that are quantifiable. And the more that we get caught in the quantifiable realm, the less we can actually dip into the, the qualitative aspects of life, which are far more nourishing and far more important in, in many ways than the material realm. Um, because I think in general, we have this, this craving for growth or some sort of linear correlate that, that links us with skyscrapers and the fact that we can upload our photos to the cloud and everything technological that lends itself to the material realm, which is three-dimensional, when really the, the human experience and the human journey is about moving through depths. And I think this, this interverse that we talk about and how we navigate from out to in or in and through is tapping into something that's really important to, to bring all of that energy back into yourself. So I, I love the name of the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, man. I guess I don't think that we need to bandy around with trying to get backstories out there or anything. I, I'd rather just jump right into some of the really meaty conversation topics because there's so much on the plate here. And if at any point something about your backstory or your personal journey is going to help illustrate that, of course, go for it. Anything you want to express is open here. But I want to talk about the accumulation thing, because the way I'm seeing our personal growth 
in a positive light. Like you said, it has nothing to do with what you're accumulating on the outside. But there is a type of accumulating that we do that, in my opinion, is kind of healthy. And that's like on the prana level. So breathing practices, uh, eating correctly, getting the right movement practices involved for your body. All these things are like pranic accumulation. And uh, that's also something that's widening your aperture for how much reality you can perceive because prana is the life force and reality is life itself. And it's all kind of one energetic uh, fractal spectrum, right? So let's talk about accumulation, both the way that it works externally and how that's affecting us as a society and on individual levels. And then about maybe then we can flow into a different type of accumulation, this pranic accumulation that is actually sort of what we're more here to do because that's a, the real, the truest and most real renewable resource that there is. Absolutely. Yeah. So before I get into the, the one level of accumulation, I'd like to touch upon the, the pranic one because I think ultimately you're, you're correct, but I think that realistically we're not accumulating it because if you look at the energy flow of the chakras and if you're actually looking to consume in tantra, you, you, you consume the external world into yourself, how the child consumes the mother's milk into, him, into his or herself. And when you're doing that, really, that energy is used as nourishment, which doesn't accumulate and get stuck in the body, but the energy starts to flow up through the root and all through the other chakras and, and come in in this toroidal type of shape. So it's never actually accumulating in a sense. You're just opening yourself to hold more of it or to welcome in more of it to move through you in a, in a way. Um, so I think that, I think that's kind of, that, that's one way to, to look at the pranic level. And then we can now bring it back to, uh, to accumulation in general. So it, in, in Ayurveda, they call the first stage of disease Sanchaya. So I'm actually going to zoom a little back just to give a small backdrop. So I was studying Ayurveda in Kerala in India this past maybe two winters ago and that that was the first time that i really begun to understand from a yogic perspective where ayurveda and yoga intertwine and i think that this is a really important thing is that we still are like segmenting these sort of sciences and not understanding that they are enmeshed in one another because in order to truly achieve a state of union which is what yoga is about you have to decrease the identifications and decrease the accumulations in you that are projecting onto reality for you to now see reality as you think that it is when it actually isn't the way that you think that it is. So, so Ayurveda helps to do this on an elemental level by introducing the fact of the doshas and introducing the fact that all of these elements carry a specific characteristic of movement, like earth is stability and fire is transformation and air is uh, can, can lend itself to restlessness, for example. So like utilizing these elements with our inputs, you can then basically change the way that you are based on the input or the element, based on your specific elements. And I think where this extrapolation began to happen was in India, where I started to see that from a yogic perspective, everything that we're consuming, even on a belief system or a nationalistic level or a political level or a knowledge level, everything that we're, that we're inputting into ourselves, if it's not calibrating through a simultaneous output where there isn't righteousness attached to it, it's only going to lead to disequilibrium. And essentially, the, the whole point of this, this journey, especially in a yogic journey, is to reach an Ayurveda as well is to reach a point of equilibrium where you're not tossed consistently in this tetherball swing of the external winds of the world. And enable to, and to do that, you have to be fluid in the ideas and the inputs and all of these things that you're taking in, because if you're not fluid in them, then they're going to get caught and that's going to create blockages in the body physically. It's going to create blockages in the chitta. It's going to create blockages in the emotional body, which there are techniques to heal. But in general, if you, if you continually 
take things in and cling to them, which brings us into Buddhism and how all of these things are intertwined. The clinging of all of this is really where, is where we get caught, is thinking that that's the way only. Uh, there's a great paraphrase that you have early in the book from George Carlin talking about consumption. He says, the American pastime changed from baseball to consumption long ago, including not only material goods, but also the consumption of ideas, ideologies, beliefs, fandoms, information, identifications, and more, which separate us from each other by forming strongholds of collective identity that make us feel right. And I think this is a really a subtle aspect of it, but that's actually a huge, hugely magnified in Western society, especially the millennial generation, where if I was to get on Facebook and go to their page where they showcase videos or whatever, because maybe I've liked comic books or liked something related to comic books, there are videos that'll come up where it's like a two hour discussion where a couple of people are discussing what's going to maybe happen in the next Thor movie and why that is. And Maybe the Vikings and space thing should be funny because it like I just for out of curiosity, I watched like 30 seconds of a video like this. Just be like, what, what, what else, what else is out there for content? And, you know, they're having this deep conversation about like, should the space Vikings be self-serious or should they be humorous? It should it be more dramatic and opera like, should it be more comedic? And, you know, I'm not saying that they shouldn't have this job, but this is like a type of job you can have in today's society where you're literally just speculating about fiction. And that's because everything in the society is built on fiction after fiction after fiction. The fiction of personhood, the digital identity, these are things that have been covered in recent topics on the show a lot. And the fact that we have these like groups that form around fandoms, not only the consumption aspect, but a lot of people are just taking in all of this... Uh, media and, and TV shows and things, and they can't wait to get to the water cooler to showcase how much they retained of the trivia about whatever last night's new episode of whatever was. It's maybe a little different now because of the way TV is now bingeable instead of having to wait weekly for your, your fix or whatever. But just the very fact that they need, they feel the need to output all that um, demonstrates that there's a natural inclination for the flow of what comes in to come out. And I think this is, uh, there's a lot of junk that we're filling ourselves up with and it's not getting an outlet and it is accumulating. And I just think all the time of like the, not that these things in themselves are bad, but like the novels or video games I played in the past where I could, it may have been 20 years since I played it, but I could tell you the whole plot, <laughs> like it's all still in there. And you know, I don't think that there's a limit to our capacities, but our attention there's a limit to that capacity. And, yeah. you know, if we're spending that currency in a different way, what might be passing through us might be a lot more higher levels of energy rather than stuff that just gets in there and gets lodged in there and stuck in there and takes the place of something else you could pay attention to, if that makes sense. Not to Absolutely. mention the identity aspect of like, oh, I'm a nerd and you're into sports, so we can't get along or like really stupid high school level stuff like that, that still happens with so-called adults. Yep. Yeah. I think you touched upon a couple important points there. First one is the, the, the fluidity of the information that's coming in and out. And I think the, the word that came in my mind is calcif calcification. And I think that that atrophying of the fluidity of information, which we can call belief if that actually starts to take form where it creates a juxtaposition or a hierarchy between you and another person where judgment then forms rather than acceptance of the differences, then I think that that's where the violence comes in. And Krishnamurti talks about this all the time. He says, nationalities, religions, sports teams, whatever your collective identity is, beautiful, but simultaneously it creates violence. And it creates violence because people cling to these identifications as the way rather than understanding that everyone has their own unique way. And this is one of the biggest issues in our society, which creates rampant polarization. Um, the second part that you touched upon, which I think is really important, is attention and the inflow of dense information or information that's not necessarily benefiting us in any way, shape, or form versus the attention towards the subtleties that I think is really where you start to tap into the energetic body because 
I mean, the, the sushumna, which is one of the, part of the breath body in yoga, is said to be thinner than a hair. So realistically, like how, how do we expect to utilize these gross inputs in our life, gross meaning material, um, to then tap into these subtle layers? So if we, if we continue to operate on superficial levels, that input is going to naturally calcify because it's trapped in the material realm. And the material realm, as in accordance to natural law, has these movements of decay and all of these other things that happen. But if you can tap into the energetic level and bring your attention or the, the, the attention of your awareness into these places, then you're really providing yourself a, a portal into the, the unseen, which I think is hard for us to, to get a grasp on because we can't see it. And we have a hard time quantifying the experiential realms. Um, and plus our society operates on such a superficial level on a consensus basis that like if you walk up to the water cooler and you start talking about playing with prana the guy's gonna be like what the fuck are you talking about you know <laughs> that's definitely unless, i mean the, place, it, the places where i've worked that really that, cool yeah <laughs> places where i've worked there'd be no room for a conversation about prana uh no. generally speaking i remember i was talking to somebody at work one time and brought up I didn't want to say astrology. I just said sky clock. And the guy was like, because <laughs> I thought astrology, he'll be out if I say astrology. So I said sky clock and he's like, I'm out. <laughs> he walked away. <laughs> it was just like that. But yeah, the interesting thing is though, like bringing the lens of um, those more subtle bodies to even something as sort of gross as entertainment, you can still actually see deep, archetypal movements that represent something in yourself through symbolism, through what you're looking at. Like everything can be the teacher. Even, even me looking at a, a video about people talking about a Thor movie. That's not even out yet for a minute. Like pay, bringing attention to that is actually anything could be the teacher if you're bringing your attention to it. But mm -hmm. I'm going to quote your book again here. You say we're now constantly in a state of either being distracted or being the distractor. This mantra of multitasking is in the name of efficiency and productivity and thrives on the lack of our attention spans caused by instant gratification. Our ability to concentrate is being whittled away at such a clip that the average attention span now of a human is eight seconds. And man, I can attest to that. Sometimes even like waiting at a red light, I feel this weird magnetism like, hey, check your phone while you're at the red light, you know, <laughs> check it. You might see a notification. You only have three seconds to check it, but... Go, go, for, go for it. Quit just sitting here and being okay with sitting here, you know, and there's a lot to that too. You're not even necessarily taking in the thing that you're trying to do with entertainment because you're also <laughs> having a conversation with someone in the room and looking at your Facebook at the same time and maybe three other things too. Yeah. Yeah. Why do you think, why do you think people have such an aversion to being and that they need to supplement their lives with doing something? The funny thing about being is you're already doing being is a verb right there. <laughs> like, I think that that's a, a separation in a, in a way too to be like, uh, non doing is somehow a choice because you're always a process unfolding. Um, you're never frozen in a status or a noun or a moment. Mm -hmm. And so like you can relax that even non action is a form of, like resting is actually a doing in a sense, like you're allowing something under the surface to have the energy for a little while that might be necessary for flow to continue. You know, that's like a, a very important thing too. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I think you're tapping into like the Wu Wei and the Tao kind of, kind of where, where you're going with it. But I don't think most people are tapping into that when they're thinking about, checking their phone at a red light, right? It's like, how, how, how can I fill these moments with something that distracts me from deepening myself into these, these subtleties of the fact that I have nothing to do? And am I okay with having nothing to do? Which is not possible, as you're saying. But, 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 but it's this fear of like, who am I beyond my actions? 
who am I without this? Who am I without my phone? Who am I without my digital identity? Who am I without my personality? Who am I without my, who am I? And this is what Ramana Maharshi talks about as a self inquiry. Just keep asking, who are you continually behind? Who are you behind this? Am I Ryan? Well, I guess I'm Ryan now, but like, am I fully defined by Ryan? Okay, no. Who am I behind this? Who am I behind my body? Who am I behind this? And slowly you get to the point where you're just awareness or the witness. And I think that that journey in itself, that deconstruction process into perceived emptiness, which is still full, is something that's very scary for people. Because when you cling to the identity, you're clinging to a limited model of who you, th- who you think that you are versus who you truly are. But in order to give that up, you have to start to give up your story. You have to start to give up this continuity, which is an illusion. Because on a quantum level, we're just trillions of particles rising and falling away. And in, the, in, in Vipassana meditation, from an experiential level, the goal is to get to a point of equanimity within the craving and aversion of the sensation to understand experientially that which, which one of the trillion particles that make up your body is the I. And it's not, right? It can't be. It's always changing. It's always rising and falling away. It's always anicca, which is changing. But, but this is very scary and for a lot of people because who are you without you? <laughs> well, I look at it like the ultimate self being a seed that became the tree. And you can't get in there and find that seed that became the tree. In the moment, it is the tree, but it's going to shift into more seeds and the tree part will be gone and every aspect of it is cyclical and impermanent. But I think what's interesting about, to go back to this goldfish level attention span thing, I think it has a lot to do with value and false valuation. We value, as you talk about in your book, you, we value everything in time. Like, what is my time worth? And we connect that to like, what can I get paid per hour of work? and if we're looking at time that way, we're looking at moment to moment that way, then the five seconds that you're at the stoplight is a very non-valuable five seconds. It's just like, well, of course I could throw away this five seconds on a, a distraction because it's not worth much because we've undervalued just how powerful it would be in three or five seconds to take one to three really good breaths. And I've had moments where like, I remembered my breath, and I only remembered my breath for like two or three breaths, but that was enough. And I was like brought up to, uh, I was brought up to the energy level, if you will, that I needed, or I got the prana I needed just out of that. It's, mm-hmm. there's infinite value in every breath and every moment. And, or mm-hmm. in another way of putting it is priceless. There's no value. And it's the same thing. Right. Yeah, totally. I, I think it brought up kind of this, this dualistic thought in me where, we throw away time if we think it doesn't have value while simultaneously we're trying to optimize it for value. And and we're like caught in the middle of both. We're like, Oh, here's five seconds at the traffic light, like worth nothing. Whoop, like do something here. Like, Oh, five seconds at the traffic light. Like, let me bump out this email or something. So it's like, we're always trying to push it away or dip into it. And I think this really stems back to the Vipassana, which is, it's at the root of desire, which is, leads into the split of craving and aversion. And the way, that we, the way that we work with time, which is this construct, as you mentioned at the beginning, is that we're always trying to get something out of it or to push it away. And at the root of both of those is, is the portal which, where you tap into, where you don't need to be pushing away or craving it, and then you're just in it. And I think that that's presence. And I think that presence is emptiness. And I think that gratitude is emptiness because within that emptiness, you're being filled. And that's where the paradox comes in is that only when you're truly empty or stopping your projection of your value system or whatever you're having onto the environment, can you truly tap into the one that is a value, which is you. This is a good place to talk about this idea of transactionality a little more because it's really deeply rooted in everything from work relationships to even 
interpersonal or romantic relationships, the idea, the illusory perception of the need for the constant exchange of things to be in equal value. And there are indigenous cultures where that even that concept is a taboo, that if someone gives you a gift and you turn around and give them something that is roughly equivalent to the same thing, they're just like, they'll look at that like, well, you just rejected my gift then because you gave me the same thing back or what you perceive to be the same thing back. And it's more healthy. Like in the bio field, for example, are the chakras there, there are, there's stuff going on in the back and the front. Like it's, we're meant to receive and let out. And that's part of the emptiness thing too. You're just not letting things get stuck in your vessel. I, this is actually exactly why, I prefer the word permeable over vulnerable when we talk about getting the armor, taking off the armor of our energy bodies, of our pain bodies, of our emotional bodies, and letting the feels actually in our fields be brought to awareness because they they rise up and pass away and it's a permeability. And the idea of vulnerability, that word, I'm not saying that we aren't all vulnerable to some degree, but it's almost like inviting To me, that word is almost like inviting the wounding aspect of an emotion or the stuck aspect of it. Because if you're vulnerable, then you can be hurt. And if you're hurt, then that's something that needs healed. But if you're permeable, the thing comes through and passes through, if if that makes sense. And it's um, it's just a semantic. (laughs) I don't know if it's even a disagreement, just uh, alteration. Yeah. No, I've been experiencing this experiencing this recently i think it's a it's a continual practice to open yourself up to receive and receive before you then give (laughs) it's like i was just in miami and with my friend and 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 me and her grandmother like really hit it off and her grandmother was teaching me to dance cumbia and her grandmother was a a student a disciple of swami muktananda so we we were like really getting in on it and she practiced Reiki on me and it was, it was just a really beautiful experience. And her, her grandmother said this really beautiful compliment to me. And I was like, thank you. You too. And she's like, no, <laughs> just sit there and receive it. And I was like, oh, okay, like let's try again. And, and we did it again. And it's like, it, it's really hard for us to receive the same amount of pleasure that we are open to receive in our lives that we receive with from pain. It's like, we're way more open to receive pain than pleasure. It's like, we have to like take, give the pleasure right back to somebody else. Like we, like we don't feel like worthy enough to hold in that pleasure. And I think when you're talking about this permeability, I think it's a beautiful semantic alteration and another cool semantic alteration i heard is vulner vulnerable bravery because ability like vulnerability sounds like a disability and all of a sudden that is is making us feel like even the emotional charge around the word vulnerability makes us feel weak which we then attribute to the feminine and like we just follow the emotional charge down of like how we're misinterpreting like all of these terms it's like that permeability is important because that's the only way to achieve balance. And if we're not achieving balance, then you, like you're saying, you can never be, you can never be emptied if you're full. And what are you full of? A lot of us are like literally full of shit with like the food and stuff that we consume, right? Like our intestines are being blocked. And but like, what else are we full of that is preventing us from being fully permeable to receive the blessings that are coming through? Yeah, and to go back to the transactionality thing a little bit, I really think it's uh, disingenuous because we all value things differently and the value of things by society is constantly changing and some things don't even get the value that they deserve. Like, um, for example, modern feminism would want not every feminist, I'm not trying to do a blanket statement here, but like a lot of thought in modern feminism would say that uh, a woman is only equal to a man if they can go out and have the same job as their male partner, pull in the same amount of, as, of money, have a transactionally close to equal balance of monetary flow, if you will. Uh, and then that leaves you know nobody available to do things 
that might be part of the shared space's responsibility because they're both out chasing the paper. And it's like, whether it's the, the female or the male that's maybe at home more, maybe caring for a child more, or maybe doing chores around the house or preparing meals, all of these things, because there's not like a paycheck involved with it, it's seen as lesser when it's really no different than any other part of the basic upkeep of life. And the time spent is equally valueless and priceless, but regardless of what task you're doing, that's part of a dynamic that you're in. So I, I've personally experienced like friction in relationships over the fact that I was, I spent more on the food that we both ate or something like that. Like, and to me, I just wanted things to be a gift or everything, a gift. And like, I receive gifts from you. You receive gifts from me. There's no scorecard, but it can be very hard for people to get out of that scorecard mentality, even with people that they care about the most, because they get into a belief that they are worth less because what they're doing is perceived as worthless. And in fact, it's priceless, not worthless. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think that's a really good focal point is priceless versus worthless. I think that's, that's a really good thing to focus on because it taps back into this, our fascination with the material realm and that we think that it needs to be equal on that level. When realistically these priceless things, which is our presence and the gifts that we're bringing into our lives, this is what really matters on, on some level. So like to, to need to like have this scorecard, like you're saying of, Oh, well, I bought the oat milk like two weeks ago. Like, can you buy my quesadilla today? Or like trying to like calibrate this, this monetary realm with the spiritual realm and the emotional realm and the levels of fulfillment that come from that. It's like, it's like speaking two different languages. It's like, how, how are you going to calibrate those together? So I think, yeah, I think, I think it's a detriment to take transactionality into the invisible realms because I don't think that it operates in that way. Just because you give me a massage doesn't mean I need to give you Reiki. I can just receive your massage and say, thank you. And later you might get something from somebody else or you might not. If it's really a gift, you just give it. It's not, it's not a gift if you're clinging to reciprocity. It's tricky because reciprocity is what we want to occur, but we need to see it as a, a, a larger dynamic. Like, does a cell in your body that receives a nutrient from another cell turn around and give the exact same thing right back to the cell it got it from? No, but it might pay it forward to a different cell somewhere else in a different way. Or it might not, but the thing is that all the cells are working together as one and they're not, <laughs> they're not worried about the value of what they give to each other. It's a single organism and humanity could be that way, but it would never work if it was controlled from the top down. Yeah. Well, we also have expectation models of how the reciprocity will, will come in. So if I give you a gift of A, I'm expecting already there's an issue because it's not a gift because I'm expecting something from, from this point, even if I were to get another gift, I, I already have an expectation model that I will receive a gift in B form. So we're already limiting the infinite potential of ways that we can receive gifts. And I think plant medicine has been one of, one of my greatest teachers because it shows it's been able to show me what medicine really is. And medicine can come in or a gift can come in in a way that you have no idea that it's going to come in. It might come in through a hardship in your life that it, that has the capacity to wake you up because it shakes you free of the structure that you've concreted your feet in when you're just trying to walk up the mountain. But if I give you a gift and I get some hardship in my life, why am I viewing that as not a gift? Why am, I, why am I thinking that I'm not achieving equilibrium? It's that I'm just all thinking it because I only have an expectation model of what I want to receive. And I think, to, like you're saying, broaden the scope, to broaden this horizon into the fact that sometimes moments in our lives that involve immense suffering can be gifts. I think that that's a really important thing that a lot of times we ignore in our lives is we, we have this woe is me victim mentality when Ram Dass talks a lot about suffering as grace, right? It's like 
how do we really begin to view every single moment as a teacher and every single moment as a gift, even if the gift is coming in a package that we didn't expect? Yeah, the, the commerce thing, I think people should constantly keep in the front of our minds going forward into whatever age that we're in the onset of here, because I think that we can make any type of exchange systems work for ourselves if we recognize the pricelessness in everybody around us and in the what we call resources of nature. I mean, that's even wordplay in itself. Resource is just you're taking source and now you're dividing a piece of source away from nature and saying it's a resource and I can own it because it has this designation. And that's, <laughs> we need to just be aware that like, you know, we can receive from nature and we can give back to nature, but to just consume and consume and consume, uh, or to even in our interpersonal relationships or transactional relationships, if we're constantly at the goal of how can I profit off of somebody, then it is like a never ending state of warfare against our self, against the world, against each other, because it's nothing but extricative. Is that how you say that? You're extracting and yeah. uh yeah, and exploitive, even if you don't intend for it to be in your conscious mind, you're still like, should I ask for twenty more bucks or or what? And it's tricky because there's a balance that we have to still maintain if we're gonna live in Babylon, which Right now, there's not really a place in the world that you can go that there isn't some shadow of Babylon there to to t tickle you in the night. <laughs> so it's like, yeah, we we need to value our our gifts to others too in a in a weird way. But mm -hmm. like, we can't just give away everything that we own and wind up. Uh, I mean, we could, but we'd wind up in the same place as we were before if we thought, okay, this is going to solve my spiritual condition or conditioning if I just become completely depossessed of all objects. But then you're just running a different game where I now need everybody and everything around me to take care of me using the objects that they're responsible for. And uh, I'm just going to give up all responsibility for the objects and let the universe take care of me. I think there's something in the middle, a middle way there that we could do because at the end of the day, if you're just shirking all responsibility for maintaining the gross mundane material aspects of life and expecting or hoping uh, that it's going to be just taken care of for you or you'll, or you'll die. And that was your destiny. <laughs> I feel like that's sort of uh, get, you know, trying to completely get out of the Dharma or completely leave the marketplace. I think we sidestep a lot of the lessons that are important for us there. Yeah, and what you're describing is aversion to Babylon. So you, you can either crave it, become like some finance hedge fund stockbroker and like drive around a Lamborghini, or you can be averse to it and you try to give up all possessions and like live in this, in this intentional way. But like you said, it's like either one of them, no matter where you step, like you're either pushing it away or you're trying to get to it, you know? And it's like the middle way is where it's at. Like how do you utilize the, the value structure that we're in? to move through it, to create something new and beautiful, but yet simultaneously don't get caught in it. And I think that that's really the, the, the important thing here is like, especially with Babylon, I don't know how far you got in the book, but there's one section that talks about the root word of Babylon, which I learned from this old man in Boston who is an Aramaic scholar. And he, we were listening to jazz music in this like old dusty apartment. And I, was asking him about reggae and he didn't know too much about reggae, but he did know about Babylon and the word comes from Balal, which means to confuse. And I think it's so interesting that Babylon is just built upon confusion. And it's, it's really this confusion that, that we're talking about, right? It's like, well, this doesn't resonate with me, but like, I have to do it. So like, I have to rip off my brother and sister to like make a living. Like I, this is confusing, but I like, I got to feed my children. Like, and you're caught in this place where any decision that you make is stepping on somebody. And it's like, we really want a computer to have these beautiful discussions or to do work. But simultaneously, the computer company has to mine cobalt in the Congo and they have child workers in the mine. It's like, 
where do you step, you know? So I, th- I, I think it's hard. Like, how do you embrace that middle way? And does it need to be hard? Maybe we just conceptualize it as hard, but how do you, how do you walk in such a, a gentle way that still takes in, a, in accordance with your own value about how you were then reflect that value into the world and can receive it back um, in a way that hopefully is creating the least amount of harm and also helping to alleviate the most amount of suffering. Babylon is a, a trip of word too, because the, the concept of the tower of Babel and language is being confused. And that's really where we're at. Not just the fact that there's so many languages on the realm, but the fact that we don't even see one word the same way as the way another person sees it. And the, uh, what's interesting is the control systems of the world, whether it's the, the old thousand year reign of the Vatican and their use of Latin, or the fact that there's a thing called legalese, which is actually Latin, but set to the English grammatical uh, structure. It's complete. Those are completely dead languages in a sense. Like they don't evolve and change with, the usage of the regular people. And I think that's what makes them great as sort of calcified control systems because operators within those systems can say what they mean and somebody 200 years can read it and still know what they meant and Mm -hmm. perfectly. And we don't get that luxury even in our communication with each other in a one-to-one We're we babble on all day to each other. (laughs) And a lot of times nothing even really gets communicated. It's nothing but contradictions, which is canceling out. And that's transactionality in a, mm-hmm. in a weird way. It's canceling out uh, one thing, canceling out the other. Instead of there being a f- free flow, there's uh, something that's just bouncing back and the system's jammed up in ourselves in, in a esoteric way, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's a co-destruction as opposed to a co-creation. That, that actually, yeah, that works. That fits pretty well for sure. Yeah. I notice a lot of relationships at the beginning with certain friends because the, the perspectives that I seem to bring oftentimes challenge the consensus understanding of how things are happening that like, some of my friends will just continually try to poke holes in a way that's not kind. It's like, it's like they're trying to code destroy me to prove that they're right. And it just, it's like all of these contradictions, right? It's like, I thought you were my friend. Like, why are we, why are we channeling this energy together to create something out of both fields rather than you trying to prove that your field is superior to mine? And you can't even, and you're not even going to be able to do it because you're operating on one level of the understanding of field, (laughs) you know? And it's like to really be able to do this, which I think is beyond the polarization, which is what we see. That's like this major buzzword, blah, blah, blah. It's like, everyone's just coming at each other, trying to defend their own side rather than like literally meet together and come up in a way that is going to create true change that overflows the cup into all sorts of different structures that we can then envision together. And and Charles Eisenstein calls it the more beautiful world our heart knows possible, I think, Um, where we can literally co-create a reality together rather than co-destroy and leave ourselves in a place that nobody wants to be. I like that a lot. And it makes me think too of when we're, encountering somebody with beliefs different than ours or perspective different than ours, instead of trying to bludgeon them over the head with ours and be the right one that's right and try to take their prana in that way. uh, We should be able to question the beliefs of another and they should be able to answer our questions and then question our beliefs. And we both grow that way. Every question that is answered leads to more questions and that's what makes it co-creative. It's uh, like branches of a tree that just keep going out. But when you try to destroy the other person's belief, come in with a sledgehammer, then they're in the position of needing to defend their prana and it goes nowhere, nowhere good anyway. And like even stuff that I read out of the, uh, the age of separation, I 
there, there were parts where I went, uh, that's not exactly the way I see it. But instead of wanting to come up with uh, some proof of why that's an incorrect perspective, instead I would just write down my question about it. Just write down a question about it. And then keep reading and see if, if it's just a language di- operating difference or semantic difference or uh, even if my question still stands or my differing of perspective still stands, it doesn't rule out every other perspective that I vibed with throughout the whole thing, you know, right. and yeah. we, <laughs> we can't put, we can't put ourselves on the pedestal of being the one that's got it all right. But we also can't put someone that we're looking at as a, a teacher on the, on a pedestal. Nobody benefits from a pedestal relationship any more than they would benefit from if you cast them in a pit below you and put your, you know, like this, this is where separation comes in. They're above me. They've got talent They're They've got wisdom. <clears throat> they have the image of success. That's really all it is now is the image of success. Um, the, you, you mentioned how people speaking more on monetization or commodification of everything. That's even knowledge is done that way. Uh, monetized the appearance of knowledge through the the imagery or symbolism that would create the illusion of identity that is the authoritatively trendy one. Like <laughs> the example you gave was, you know, all the love to them. This isn't like they're they're not wrong. They're just doing. They're just following what gives them a good feeling and prana. But there's you know yoga girls all over Instagram that have thousands of followers because their butt looks good in their yoga pants and they get the they get the illusion that they have authority because of the how high the numbers have accumulated there even though they may or may not know anything about the spiritual tradition of yoga this is not a judgment of them like the every every realm this happens even in the people that are experts on comic books <laughs> they wear the right t-shirt they they look like they know what they're talking about so they get the followers that want to be part of that identity uh subgrouping and yeah, this, this is a consensus reality is built this way, as you explain in that chapter. Yeah, it's it's getting lost in the concept rather than the integration. And I think because these concepts are trendy, it's very easy to hop on a bandwagon on a superficial level of understanding, which is fine because a superficial of understanding is prior to a deeper level of understanding. And this lends itself to the fact that no one is ever off of the path. You can't get off of it. You never got on it. It's like we're navigating our way through it. If something resonates with you, cool. But to get trapped in the concept and think that that's all that it is, and then to utilize that to bolster your own image, you're probably not honoring the, the truth of the concept. <laughs> especially in a lot of these spiritual ways, right? It's like spirituality is a deconstruction process. It's a demolition project. It's not about the fact that you can do Reiki and you have 13 different tarot decks on Pleiadians and like you haven't eaten meat in 43 years and all. It's not about like tallying yourself up and adding these little checks to your belt. It's about lessening all of the things that you cling to in order for you to feel whole. And ironically, the more that you give up in this way or the less that you attach to the more power that you have because your worth is no longer being allocated to some identification or to some external thing like a car. You're pulling all of this responsibility back into you and that responsibility is energy and all of a sudden now when you have less and less that you need to tell yourself makes you worthy you are more worthy and you know the clothes that old phrase the clothes make the man you can invest prana in anything that you invest attention attention and intention into like there's certain shirts that i wear whenever i'm on a podcast video that and other shirts that I wouldn't wear. And it's not like I couldn't do the thing without the right shirt on, but you like sure. Yeah, yeah, and that's okay too. I mean, we can yeah. use the trappings or the image of something in a constructive way. Yeah. That isn't overly identifying. Like there's yeah. magic, there's magic in your outfit. Like that 
you know, are are you dressed like uh, in a suit and tie, like you're going to work at Boeing as a, an executive? Or are you dressed like a yogi? Are you dressed like somebody that somebody that likes art? All those things are okay. It's okay to send signals to each other that way too. It's just like it's not your identity. That's the thing, right. and we we can work with that. And also not to same thing. Don't judge a book by its cover. Don't assume that the the profile picture of someone that you're seeing that's so beautiful is really them. It's really them on their best day or the day that they wanted you to see them on because <laughs> we're all in a different place every day. Yeah. Yeah. While you're talking about the word that comes up in my mind is liturgy. Like it, like in a church, for example, with the swaying of the, the box with the incense and the stained glass windows and it, all of it is evoking a feeling, right? A nonverbal communicative feeling. And I think really what these clothes and what these things can do, they can be liturgy. They can allow people to enter into a communicative state with us on a nonverbal level that opens them up more to receive a message that, that may be, may, maybe they need to hear at that time. And I think if we can utilize the nonverbal communication realms in this way of liturgy, which can evoke a level of openness and safety, then I think we're doing something that's very positive and positive meaning harmonious. But if, if simultaneously we're utilizing that image to create manipulation or to extract some sort of resource from another, then we're operating against harmony because you, nothing can be harmonious that creates harm. So how do we utilize this nonverbal communication of our skin suits, our clothes suits, the way that we may carry ourselves in a nonverbal way? How do we utilize that to bring in people into a level of harmony? And I guess you can't really bring them in, but you can invite them in, right? Invite, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Invite. yeah, you can. I like that you... Uh, shifted, pivoted from positivity to harmonious because, yeah, I mean, we need both poles. We need this. This may be a good place to uh, preface some of what will come up in the second hour. We can talk about, you know, the void. <laughs> what is the void? And it, my one of the trippiest things that I've ever realized about life in, in this realm is that you can only ever see 180 degrees of anything that you look at and that <laughs> the fact that something is obscured is the reason why you're seeing what you're seeing. You're paying attention to what you're paying attention to because you're not paying attention to all the things that you've obscured. And so operating from that realization can be helpful because you can be mindful of the fact that you're always obscuring something from yourself to see what it is you want to see no matter what. But we, we can kind of get into that in a little bit, but I want to give you the last five or so minutes to talk about what you can do for others on a <laughs> transactional level, how they can work with you in a, in a harmonious way, the type of help that you are here to offer and the th resources that you've provided and, and books that you've written, give everyone the layout, the full spread of Ryan Kemp buffet. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Thank you for opening that up. So, I've basically been traveling the world for about nine years, never being in the same place longer than three months, it turned out, which was not planned by any means. But throughout that time, I've been able to gather various different skills and understandings, ranging from permaculture farming to Ayurveda to Ashtanga yoga. And naturally, I was always a writer, but it was suppressed uh, in my younger years by me trying to fit into some sort of role that was really projected from my parents about what they wanted me to be. But it took a decent dose of LSD to extricate me from that illusion. Um, so, so in this sense right now, there is a buffet of books that I've written. One is the age of separation, which we've touched upon here, which is a, a full length nonfiction book that talks about how we can utilize this paradigm of separation to enter us into a point of unity. So how to navigate the duality through the middle way. Um, there's also a poetry book that I wrote on five different continents 
that I gathered from 2013 until 2020. And it's probably about a hundred something poems. And it's, it's really kind of like my journal from, from traveling around for seven different years, which is pretty cool. And that's also on Amazon. And then there's two books. First one I wrote in Hawaii called my day with the monk, which is based on a true story of the day, this 89 year old Laotian Buddhist monk who looked like the Dalai Lama abducted me willingly into his van and took me on an adventure throughout Hawaii. And I just wrote a poem on a manila envelope and it kind of brought itself to life. And the second one, a walk in the park, a tale of impermanence talks about the Mahayana Buddhist imagery of Avalokiteshvara um, and the, the impermanence understanding that Buddhism has. And it follows this young girl and her mother and through in a walk through the park as she starts to realize the beauty of impermanence. So, there, there are four books right now on Amazon. I also offer um, specific programs for people starting with an initial consultation and it kind of can dip into various different systems, whether that be IFS, um, whether that be yoga, whether that be Ashtanga, whether that just be someone to talk to them, to give them a different perspective. And then through that point, it's just a continuation of, of meeting and talking and hearing each other out and, and learning about the patterns and the conditions that kind of rule our systems and how can we not uproot these patterns, but rather love them into oblivion. Because I think one of the things that we notice a lot is that we always are trying to get rid of something to replace it. But if you think about neuroplasticity, you just have to stop treading a certain pattern. You're not getting rid of it. So a lot of the work that I do with clients is to initiate them into a deeper understanding of what patterns may be there from, from inner child, emotional trauma to societal values and conditioning. And then how do we transmute that into the compost for new growth? Um, so that's, that's a little bit about what I offer and yeah, people can find me on my Instagram page, Ryan J underscore Kemp. And, I share some thoughts there and I'm always, I, I continue to write on the side. Um, I just finished another poetry book actually just kind of poured out uh, in the last three months, about a hundred poems. Um, so that will come about at some point later, but yeah, that's about, that's about what I got for now. <laughs> Those poems are definitely a good representation of the what's going in also coming out and not being stuck circulating inside. I think that's it's awesome that you have these creative outlets and you're not just stuck in one mode of expressing yourself and yeah there there's a lot of value to to the priceless expression of your experiences to yourself but sometimes other people can catch that wave and and vibe and I'm sure people in into poetry would like to experience your travels from the sort of energetic level in that way. Very cool. And yeah, we were basically at the uh, finish line here for the first hour. It's been pretty interesting stuff. And I've got more meat on these bones, if you will, ready to go for hour two. Want to talk about nothingness. Want to talk about ego. Um, ego is the most challenging thing for all of us, right? But even for me, the concepts around ego that are taught by spiritual traditions uh to me, I, I struggle with some of the inconsistencies there too. I struggle. Struggle is not the right word. I grapple with it. I consider them. I question them. And I want to see where some of those questions lead as well, questioning ego and our ideas around it. So we're going to have an awesome second hour here, guys. Make sure that if you want to hear it, you're on Patreon, patreon.com forward slash interverse. You can get it all there. And also, Get a copy of Ryan's book. Give it a read. There's, we didn't even mention that there's, you know, on the writing side, on the expression side, there's journaling practices that, or journaling prompts that are great and even space to do it in the book. Although you might get started and realize there's way more that needs to come out than what will fit there. But it, it, at that point, you'll already be started and the flow will be pouring. So, Ryan, you got anything else for the, the free audience before we migrate our way over to the Patreon side? No, just a just a genuine thank you for the audience who's tuning into your podcast to 
to continually open themselves to new perspectives and deepen. I think it's, it's beautiful that we're all sharing this journey together and it is appreciated. So just, just a genuine thank you for, for being on this, on this path of awakening. Hey, and genuine thank you for getting in touch with me and spending some of your priceless time here today. It's been great so far and looking forward to the things we're going to talk about on the other side and uh, maybe in future conversations too, because as far as Ayurveda goes, that probably just needs to have its own entire show where we can kind of go through it in a systematic way, but we'll see what we touch on with that too in hour two. And thanks everyone for being here. We will see you on the other side. And just like that, we're at the end of another show. You know, for me, as the one making this thing, it kind of feels like a lot to keep up with to put out a weekly show. But here we are again at the end of this one. And I'm just thinking about how other podcasts I listen to that only do one show a week. I'm kind of impatiently waiting for the next one. And I hope that maybe some of you out there sometimes impatiently wait for what I'm about to put out. Overall, I think maybe I could be doing more, though, and I'm going to get there. I'm going to get there. I've got multiple projects going on. I really admire people that have written a book, so that's something that is on my to-do list for sure, and if more materializes on that, I'll let you know. But speaking of books, I think that Ryan's book is worth checking out. I definitely got some good insights out of it. One of the big issues of his book is the idea of deprogramming ourselves or the programming that we receive throughout life and how do we recognize that and counter that. And I think that maybe I was more challenging to some of the ideas of that Ryan is a proponent of in this episode than other guests I might challenge. And I hope that nobody thinks that it was just me picking on him personally. And maybe I didn't even come across as picking on it. Maybe it was just more in my mind when I'm reading the book that I'm kind of, you know, dealing with what the words on the page say with my own aperture, with my own lens and perspective and not necessarily going along with everything. And something that we need to keep in mind when we're reading anybody's book is that A, you don't have to agree with everything and B, it doesn't make them (laughs) any less of a useful teacher or guide that there are things that they said that you didn't agree with. Actually, that's a good thing. And we're trained from an early age from going to school, mostly from going to school, that we should just take whatever information is being presented to us. If the format is correct, then we should just let all that enter into our brain as being true. And I think it's more useful that somebody outside somebody else has to prove that what they're saying is true to you not that you have to prove that it's not true does that make sense so a better lens to read or to listen to things through would be that i don't accept this is true unless in the course of my own experience or the evidence that's being presented to me that it is being proven true as opposed to it's true unless i can disprove it I I think that that actually saves us a lot of time and we should apply that lens to everything, especially things I say. I'm sure that uh, there's been times where I quoted some information incorrectly and maybe you looked it up. Maybe you didn't. Maybe you just took what I said for gospel and that's cool. But just keep in mind, no matter who it is that's talking to, even if they really want to help, they're going to get some things wrong sometimes. And it's not exactly lying. If they know that they're telling you something wrong, then it's lying. But this was um, a big part of this whole conversation was the nothingness thing. For me, anyway, the concept of nothingness is fascinating. That classical existential angst that we all feel of like, is there any meaning or purpose at all? Is this all just random? Why is there something instead of nothing? What is nothingness? Is there such a thing? And as I tried to bring up in the conversation, we can only ever see half of anything. And that means that for something, to, for something to be in our perception, in our awareness, then something else has to be obscured. And that is actually the nature of the entire human experience if we're looking at ourselves as being some sort of stepping down of source energy in a way or an illusion of separation that we're in. That illusion of separation 
is why we can perceive a reality instead of just like the pure total everythingness of everything, which is no different than nothing. Because without contrast and without something obscuring part of the everything, then it's all one big uniform, you know, pleroma, right? It doesn't have any differentiation. It doesn't have any form. It doesn't have any substance. It doesn't have any qualities because all the qualities of everything and their opposite qualities are all canceling each other out. I hope this all makes sense. Nothingness is important because it's the power to forget also. And I think that there's times where forgetting is necessary for our journey. Not that something goes away permanently or never existed, but that we need to move on from certain ideas or from certain people or from certain hard feelings. And if they need to be revisited, they'll come back into our flow, but they don't need to be lingering. And a lot of the, <laughs> man, a lot of the problems are that we've actually lost this power of, of the void, of nothingness, of saying no, of forgetting. because. We're in an age where more and more things are recorded permanently and there's less, in a weird way, we're externalizing our memory and we're doing something with memory that it was never actually intended to be. Like, I don't think that our memory was supposed to ever be like a perfect digital carbon copy of everything that ever happened because in the human experience, memory is more slippery than that. You don't ever actually re-experience something that you remember you re-experience the story of what it is that you told yourself about what happened and you re-experience it from the lens of the last time that you told yourself that story. Uh, <laughs> another way of looking at it is that when we're really stressed and we're holding a lot of hard, bad juju in our field, uh, dissonant energy in our field, trauma energy, then yeah, what am I what am I even saying? That trauma energy that holds in our field is kind of like something that we can't let go of, we can't forget. In a way. In a weird way we're ignoring it, but we're not forgetting it. So ignorance is not the same as forgetting. And our fields I think are are where the memory is stored. So the reason why you don't remember what is going what was like on your breakfast plate when you were in third grade on the 15th of April is because there's no reason for that to be held on to in your field. And the same goes like when we look at the way that memory is stored in this digital <laughs> current age, there's a lot of stuff that comes back into our awareness that maybe there's really not a natural pathway for that to have come back to us. Sometimes it's cool. Like I might see on social media a, a post I made three years ago and go, wow, I still think that that is an applicable or interesting statement today, and I'll repost that. But I guess what I'm trying to point out is that we're, we're externalizing our memory. We're not, we're not strengthening our ability to remember things naturally, because for that to happen, we need a stronger field. And I think the healthier your bodily energy is, your bioelectricity flowing is, uh, if it's at an optimal type of flow, you will have a better recall of things, generally speaking. And in those places where there's a dam in your waterway, <laughs> where you've dammed a part of yourself, if you will, you created a type of demonic offshoot uh, you know, thought form that is being ignored and compartmentalized and isolated and separated off for yourself and saying, that's not me. This is what we do with trauma or with uh, you know, hard feelings, hard experiences. That damming of the flow is also like a wall, a barrier between you and parts of the river, if you will, that are earlier on. I think this is why the people that have like childhood trauma or abandonment issues, a lot of times they can't see back into the past earlier than a certain point. This isn't true for everybody, by the way. Some people just have really good memories and this might be a field strength too. I mean, this is all just conjecture. <laughs> I, I really do think, though, that memory is kept in the electromagnetic bioenergy plasma, if you will, that is constantly swirling around inside and around us. So that's just my take on memory. I don't think that there's ever been any proof that memory is stored in the brain somewhere at all. So we might as well start thinking differently about it. And why it matters is because, to go back to this concept of of nothingness, it's like, you're a, yeah, I like what he said about not storing up prana. You're not actually 
accumulating prana when we were talking about the idea of accumulation spiritually versus materially. So I really do think what you're actually doing is emptying out your vessel continually. You're accumulating more prana in a sense, but you're immediately emptying it back out in the form of giving. The giving and receiving quotient is just ramped up. So in that sense, like the more empty your vessel is, the more prana it can hold at a time in a strange way. The more empty you are on the inside. And empty isn't a bad thing in this sense. This is like, think of it like relaxed instead of empty is another way to look at it. Or still instead of jittery. Because there's a lot of energy that's being tied up in your vessel just from muscle tension that you're not relaxing. So (laughs) that's what I've been doing lately, telling myself, relax, man, relax, man. And every time it pops into my head, relax, man, I go, wow, I'm clenching this or tighten, tightening over here. And my posture is just like that all the time. You might notice it too in yourself. So, you know, become, (laughs) enter the void, let the void enter you. Like, discharge a lot of those things, relax those things, and then you have more open circuitry for the, the universal life force prana of everything that's all around you all the time to come in and then come out. So in a way, it's accum- like when I said, do you, do you accumulate prana or what do you think about that? I do think there is a type of accumulation because you've, as you've opened yourself up to this life force energy, you're constantly, it's constantly flowing through you, but that means in every moment, there's as much of it in you on its way out and on its way in as possible. I mean, there's always going to be more levels of possibility there, but I I think it's the, uh, the architecture of belief that's really building the walls inside and holding up some of that juju, keeping us from being as empty as we could. I'm guilty about that too. I have a lot of things that I accept as true. And I probably say as if they are all the time. And maybe they are. Some things definitely have to be true. Otherwise, there wouldn't be a concept of true. And if you ask yourself, is there such a thing as truth? Or you say there is no such thing as truth. Then you have to immediately ask, is that statement true? And it's a paradox. It kind of proves that there is something that is true. Anyway, I've gone all this time, and I haven't even mentioned that there's a plus extension to this episode. We talked a whole extra hour and 10 minutes. If you want to get on that, it's patreon.com forward slash interverse. And I hope you do because it's always better in hour two once we're more warmed up. We get into all the things that maybe censors wouldn't like you to talk about. I mean, I don't do too much pruning of the first hour to avoid buzzwords that might catch the AI's ire. (laughs) But... You know, hour two always does feel a little more free and flowing. Maybe it's just the fact that we're warmed up, like I said. But I really want you guys in there. It's only five bucks a month, and you're getting several shows a month. So you're kind of paying like a dollar a show. I mean, in 2021, is that even very much to ask for? Yo, this is some work. I mean, it's not the hardest job in the world, but it isn't the easiest job in the world. Uh, You could make it easy, I guess. But I kind of have a direction here I'm trying to put this thing in. And I, I do put a lot of energy into it and a dollar per episode considering you get twice as much for that dollar as you were getting for free. It seems like not that much to ask. So how about you do? I love it. I love it. I love it. We got more members than we've ever had. And those awesome conversations are no longer falling on null ears. I was going to say deaf ears, but before it was just that there weren't a lot of ears at all. And now there are ears on it and eyes on it. Uh, how it works on Patreon, I don't explain this very often, but it's really easy. You follow the link, you sign up, and then you can grab a custom RSS feed link that will, you, I think they've set it up now where you just press the button and it opens up whatever your default podcast playing app is and signs you in with your Patreon login for you. And then you see Interverse Plus there just like you would see whatever other shows are in your normal podcast player library. So. That's really easy. If you get the Patreon app and if you have email notifications, one or the other or both, you'll also get more rapidly notified when there's a new show. And if you use the Patreon app or go to Patreon in the browser, there's video episodes of the Plus Extensions. It's not just an audio thing. So I think you should do it. I really do. I don't know what you're waiting for. 
It's almost my birthday. I'm going to remind you that until it is, and maybe some of you will sign up just for that reason. And once you're in, I think you're going to want to stay in because the next month is going to come around and you're going to think, well, it's only $5, and I still haven't even gotten through this huge archive of 100-plus extended shows that are awesome, or mostly awesome, I think. I've been having a good time with it. (laughs) Uh, Other things that have been a good time... Some of you guys even found me because I was on a show called Unslaved with David Whitehead and Michael Tesserion last year a couple of times, and the good news is I'm back. I returned to that show, and they published it last week, and we did the cyber tarot that I just did with Lindsay from Rogue Ways, but Michael Tesserion's take on the cyber tarot was uh, intense, intense, and he's quite a well-researched guy, definitely a strong pillar in the community around these topics, occult research and tarot and astrology. So I was excited to show him that freaky, weird transhuman tarot that came from cyberpunk, the video game and kind of pat myself on the back for even finding it just because there's not a lot of what you call original content from me personally. I'm kind of over here showing you people's original content that are other people But as far as I know, nobody has brought an analysis of that secret, creepy transhuman tarot to the internet before. And there's so much magical information to mine out of it, as creepy as it is. So if you liked that uh, series that I did with Lindsay and you like Tessarion or Whitehead and you want to see another take at it, just like whenever you do tarot cards for yourself, every time that Path of the Fool begins his journey, it's going to be different. So even though we did just do that material, it is quite a bit different. The even some of the I even realized that some of the ways I was looking at the cards were not necessarily even the correct interpretation in terms of like what the character was doing or their face. And it's amazing. We see what kind of what we want to see <laughs> and other people see other things that they are trained to see. So Oh, oh yeah. I'm going back to Unslaved, so it's worth maybe if you used to subscribe to them or never have. There's a lot of good material on there for not that much money. You could jump on for a month and check out the shows I did and other shows like it, but they're subscriber only. They don't even put out a free show, which is pretty baller move, actually. Complete support by their members, which is a goal for sure. And I'm going to make more ways for people to support me besides just the $5 a month, because as great as it is to have the extended show, it's not a huge revenue stream for me. And I'd like to be a full-time researcher and content creator and not have to work for other people doing other things. And I'm getting there and I'm doing better at that than ever before. And I've now I'm in a place where I can prioritize this and the other types of work can be on the side instead of being the main thing. So that's all good, but I need more of you. And I need help promoting the show. I'm not doing a great job promoting the show because I hate being on. It's funny. I work on computers all the time, but I hate doing more work on computers than I already do. And I should promote more. I plan to train myself up and do better about that. I'm really on the rise right now. I hope you guys know. (laughs) If you care to know. This time of year, I always feel that. Maybe it's because I'm a March baby, but. Feeling good right now, and yeah, I do hope you can also jump in the show notes and see the links for other ways to support the show if you're curious, like leaving a review on iTunes is a good way to do it, but there's a shop, you can get a t-shirt with the Interverse logo on it, that evil, terrible Luciferian logo. (laughs) It's not Luciferian, someone thought that one time. God love her. I mean, really, I'm not mad. But it it is a cool logo, in my opinion, because I designed it. And why not put it on a shirt? Then you have a conversation starter where you can tell someone about your favorite podcast. It's a win-win. And I'm going to play this out now with Lucid. It's been almost a month since I've played music from him, so you know it's overdue. And he just put out one called Source Code, which is, like, really appropriate. Because from what I can tell, this weird song has something to do with getting into the back of your brain and rearranging the wires so that... The future comes out different <laughs> than what it was coming. Anyway, so check the show notes for that too. Uh, links to Lucid and everything we talked about. Thanks for being here. 
Thanks for sitting with me for this 20 minutes of outro monologue that I thought I had nothing to say. It took me forever to come and sit down. And here we are 20 minutes deep. I'm still talking. But I'm going to cut it off. I love you guys very much. Thank you for being here and I'll talk to you soon. Bye bye.